Deep bites are really difficult to correct with the uh, aligners, right? Well, brothers and orthodontists Dr. Damon Tahiri and Dr. Ramjan Tahiri today on the podcast will be discussing how we can use specific protocols using aligners to improve the predictability of your deep bite corrections. Because I always thought that deep bite, if it's super deep bite, you're better off going for fixed appliances because aligners will struggle with deep bite correction. But speaking to the Tahiri brothers showed me that actually you can do a lot when it comes to deep bites with aligners. Which attachments should you use and when? How should you stage your deep bite correction? And what about bite ramps? What are they? Why are they so effective in deep bite correction? And why you should use them with care? Hello, Patrice Rati. I'm Jazz Glati, and you're listening to your favorite dental podcast. Thank you for joining me again. If you're new, welcome to the podcast. You picked an interesting one, a very orthodontics-based one. I cover all sorts of dentistry over the last four years or so, so do check out our backlog of episodes. Now, every main episode, I give you a protrusive dental pearl. Today's dental pearl is all about how I record my clinical videos. Now, recently on YouTube, I published a video about how to record awesome clinical videos using a loop-mounted camera. So I'll put the show links for that one below, but also if to search how to record awesome clinical dental videos, it will come up. Essentially, it's using something called an OXO 4K. I think it's a Spanish company, but they have made the best camera that I have seen. I've tried a few, and I've also spoken to a few very experienced colleagues, and they have suggested that OXO was the best. And I've been using it for over 18 months now, and you can see from the content that I post, some of the videos are really crisp, and the point of view footage that you get, especially on some of the videos I have on the Protrusive app, that's all powered by the OXO. So if you're looking about how you can use videography in dentistry, that's why I'm shine a light on the review I did recently. Now let's join the Tahiri brothers and I'll catch you in the outro. So Damon and Ramtin Tahiri, welcome to the Protrusional Podcast. Uh, great to have you both on. How are you both? Good, Jazz. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having us. First, uh, first of all, we're, we're big fans of the podcast. So we, yeah, we're, we're honored to be featured in here now and have a, hopefully have a nice chat and hopefully have something that people can learn from. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I've been looking forward to this because this the topic we're covering today, which is uh, deep bites and liners, it's, it's a big one for general dentists, a big one even for orthodontists, especially there are still some orthodontists, which we'll talk about later, that are very much fixed in their mindset that actually aligners are, are not suitable for any form of a deep bite. But when I look at your guys' cases online, like I'm just amazed about how much you two are achieving with aligners. So today I really want to extract all this goodness out of your brain and, and share it with our colleagues so we can all learn together. But before we dive into all that good stuff, tell us a little bit about yourselves, like your brothers and you both went into ortho. Like, what, what, what's that about? Yeah, so uh, Jazz, again, just to sort of come back to things, so thank you so much for having us. It's, it's uh, an absolute pleasure. We're a big fan of the podcast. And uh, yeah, we're both, both orthodontists. We uh, both uh, specialized in, in Sweden. And it was really a case for us of, like for me especially, and I went into the speciality early, slightly earlier in the day because I'm older. But it was really a case of like, I didn't, in terms of the dentistry that I was doing, it was very like NHS and, you know, based on just volume, wasn't, you know, a big fan. We were doing, and I was doing, I think this is the sort of nice thing from us is that we have been doing Invisalign for a long time. So I was doing it as a GDP. I decided to specialize because I felt like I wanted to do something different. I really enjoyed the orthodontic side of things. I went to university with one of the, at that time, one of the few universities in the world that was had a line of therapy as one of the sort of modalities of treatment, along with like lingual braces and things like that. So we really got into it at that point, really started understanding that. Is, is that why you picked it? Is that is that why you went to, to Sweden? I mean, that's, that's, that's something to unpack right there. Like, is that because you want to study in that country? Do you have some sort of connection to Sweden? Uh, yeah. Why did, How did you end up going to, to Sweden to study? So just we're, I know we're not lucky, but we're, uh, we're both Iranians originally. But uh, we're, Dame was born in Sweden. I was a year old when we moved to Sweden from Iran. And we lived in Sweden for the first 13 years of our lives. So we only came to the UK in uh, 99. And then uh, we mm. had that connection to Sweden always. So we had, you know, back and forth all the time. One of our friends who's an orthodontist said, you know, they have this opening or it's like a new year admissions time for applicants. So we just, I just tried my luck. I was, I might as well try and see what happens. You know, I was successful and, you know, decided to make it happen. I think Damon just decided to follow in that path as well. And it's such a good place to study. We had a lot of big names teaching there. You know, it's the, the founding father of implants comes from, you know, Gothenburg University. That's, you know, he was working. We had a whole Bruno in my clinic there. We had, you know, a lot of important people in orthodontics. So it seemed like a good place to go and go and study. And, but but to, to actually practice orthodontics, you decided to come back to the UK. Why is that? Do you not fancy practicing in Sweden? Just just a, uh, just just asking in yeah. terms of lifestyle choice, life and career choices, you know? I mean, Sweden is amazing. Sweden is a really nice country to uh, to live in. 
we felt that, um, you know, we feel British at this point. We feel English. And uh, although the accent doesn't agree, but we do feel English. And uh, this is where our family is. So it was never a case of moving back there because our parents are here. Um, so it was really just a case of going there, specializing in coming back. Uh, you know, I did, I think more so me than Damon, did consider maybe staying for a year or two. But at the end, it's sort of everything sort of lined up. I got a job here, everything lined up to come back to England. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. the interesting thing about being an orthodontist, something I've said to orthodontists before, and I hope you don't get offended by this, but I say it to all the orthodontists yeah. that come on the podcast, uh, is if you don't like clinical dentistry, be an orthodontist. Uh, if you don't like the whole matrix thing, if you don't like too much blood, if you don't like the scaling away uh, calculus and, uh, and prepping margins, then be an orthodontist. W was that something that you can resonate with? Yeah, I mean, per personally, I think, yeah, 50% of that is exactly what you said. I want to come to work. You know, if you've had like a tough weekend where you've just been out and about, you just want to start a Monday. You don't have to worry about like, you know, damaging a nerve. You don't have to think about missing the canal. What I like about orthodontics is very hard to mess up. Like <laughs> if you do mess up, you can normally pick up on it like six weeks down the line. So yeah, I wanted an easy life. I enjoyed mm. dentistry. I did a lot of, when I graduated, I lived, it was like 50% NHS, 50% private. I think for me personally, I found it, I find it quite stressful. I'm a little bit OCD. I always want things to be perfect and I want to be in control of it. And I feel with, with general dentistry, you know, you have to be good at fillings. You have to be good at crown preps, root canal treatments, dentures. It would take, I felt it would take a lot, you know, a really long time before I get to the level where I feel very at peace with being able to give that really high quality day in, day out. And it just felt like a really long pathway to get to somewhere where I didn't have, I enjoyed it. I didn't have a passion for it. So that's when I thought, you know, Rampton's gone and specialized. He loves it. We have very similar tastes. So I already knew I would like it. And then, yeah, when we got into it, it was exactly kind of what I'd hoped. You know, I have full control now, pretty much like 99.9% .9 of things you can control in orthodontics. And that's what I like. I don't like being out of control. And you can excel at something to a very high level. So that, that, gives, me, that gives me pleasure. That was my personal side. I know it's about a, it's a beauty it. in, in, in finding a beautiful thing about finding a niche. And then the second thing I was going to mention, actually, is as an orthodontist, like you were considering perhaps staying in Sweden, but as an orthodontist, like when you work somewhere, it, you can't just start oh, handing my notice and see you later, I'm going in three months. You've got this responsibility to be there for your patients. So I, I guess it kind of removes that element of an orthodontist being able to just move practices and fly around because you, you kind of have to commit to, to see off the treatment. So I noticed that even with GDPs who do orthodontics, they, they still have to come back to finish the cases. It, it, do you find that a bit annoying? In terms of the case, that's a very good point. You know, it's not a case of as soon as you're done somewhere, you like you give you three month notice and you go after three months. You have to finish your cases. You at least you have to wait for a replacement that's able to come in, feel comfortable with your cases, take those over. So of course, it's one of those things where I think as orthodontists, we don't quite move around practices as much as perhaps GPs might do. But you know, we 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 don't take on jobs very easily. If I could like that, like it's very like when we and it's like that with all orthodontists. Like we have our practices in Leeds. We have a couple of practices in Leeds that are NHS ortho practices, and it's not a case of you just take on anyone and you know they come and go. It's a very careful process of finding the right people, and then those people will be you know it will be easy. Okay, interview today, they start tomorrow. It's a case we create a relationship. Because they know that once they're in and they're treating patients, they're going to be there for the long haul. So, yeah, that's a bit of a difficult side of things. But at least, you know, you're much more careful when choosing somewhere to work. And and luckily, you know, since 2019 or 18, when we, when we opened up our own practice, we've sort of been in the one place. So it's been pretty straightforward. Amazing. Well, let's unpack the main theme of today, which is deep bites, right? Yeah. So I have this belief and I'm, I'm really happy for you to shatter this belief, right? But it might be true to some extent. No, right? So the belief is that the deeper the bite, I'm going to refer out for fixed appliances. So basically, uh, the, as the bite gets deeper, both in terms of dentally and skeletally, that kind of stuff that I think, okay, maybe this is not for aligners. How much truth is there in that? But also, you know, really how predictable can deep bite correction be with aligners? So it's like a two prong question. Yeah, Jazz, it's a question we hear all the time. Even my own earliest experiences with aligners was a deep bite case that just didn't go well. And I was like, you know, Invisalign's rubbish. Clear aligners are rubbish. Uh, let's go back. Let's go back to old school. And I think I think I want this is what we try to teach our delegates on our course as well is I want them to get away from the kind of mentality that, oh, aligners will only take you this far and then you need to use fixed braces. We pretty much use Invisalign in, you know, 99% of our cases, unless a patient prefers uh, fixed braces. 
Uh, sometimes we use a hybrid if, if we feel we want more control, for example, with like really complicated extraction cases. But 99% of our cases we do with aligners. And I think the first thing you need to understand is, look, every brace has its own limitation. Fixed braces have their own weaknesses. Everything has its own weakness. And once you understand what that weakness is, then it's easy to find a way around it and to navigate around that to get to the same result. So yes, obviously the, the deeper the bite, the harder it becomes to fix it, but then you have to strengthen your clinch check. You have to strengthen your plan and find what things going to add into this to make it more predictable. So yeah, I can't remember the last time we had to, well, I don't think we've ever had to change from aligners to fixed braces to fix a deep bite case. Obviously, there's cases where it's so deep that even with braces, sometimes you need to use like a bite plate to open the case. In those cases, yes, then probably you, you can consider doing maybe like a really early, like a like a removal appliance. But those cases are rare. I mean, in our in the last four years, I've probably seen you know one or two cases where it's been that deep, and that's in adults. In kids, if I see those deep bite cases, I'll be absolutely fine. Kids are ten times easier to treat results wise, as in it just behaves so well compared to adults. But yeah, I think there's probably been one or two cases in the last three years where we had to use, for example, TADS to help, uh, you know, level that lower jaw. But as long as you plan your clean check well, you understand what anchorage demands you need. You need to understand overcorrection. You need to understand, you know, accessories that you need, like bike ramps. Then you can pretty much, in, in our opinion, you can treat any case predictably with the liners. Well, we're going to unpack all those things that you said about, you know, I want to clarify for the younger colleagues about, you know, TADS and, and uh, overcorrection, what that means and how important it is for when you're designing the clean check. So we're going to unpack all that. So really, how far can you go? I think you've answered it, uh, Damon, is that actually, you know, in your specialist clinic, you don't necessarily shy away from aligners just because it's a deep bite. You just know that you're going to compensate for that deep bite correction in other ways, which, which is great to hear. And I've even seen some patients on fixed appliances and, and, and the orthodontist has really struggled to get the deep bite correction in fixed appliances. And then maybe at that point, yes, TADS might come into the equation. So let's focus on adults, right? And let's focus on, on this episode is mostly into by GDPs. And we want to help our GDPs who are, let's say, using aligners, whichever brand they're using, right, to get better outcomes. So let's imagine a patient with a 75% overbite. Okay, so 75% overbite. And obviously, that's the only information I'm giving you. So there's all the other parameters that you're fixing. But because we're homing in on the deep bite correction, how predictable can it be in terms of, you know, how certain movements have a percentage of predictability amount to it? So um, firstly, if you can unpack what are the actual mechanisms that you're doing? So for example, is it purely intrusion of the anteriors? Or is it also over eruption, if you like, it's a poor term there, extrusion, there we are, it's a better term, of the molars? What, how, how much of that is, is happening? And what predictability, you know how they get that little dots and the blue dots and the black dots. And uh, what do you tend to see with these uh, deep mic corrections? So Jazz, I think the first thing to realize is that, you know, aligners as other types of appliances have their inherent weaknesses when it comes to deep bite correction. And I think the number one thing that everyone alludes to is the fact that you have this plastic between the teeth posteriorly. So there is this intrusive, inherent intrusive force on these posterior teeth. So in effect, what we're doing is in a deep bite, when we're trying to open the bite up, we're doing the opposite with the trays. The patient keeps clenching on these bits of plastic, they keep pushing teeth away from each other. As a result, the mandible sort of shifts, swivels up and forward to form a motor rotation to make the bite even deeper. So in terms of how we try to treat these cases, I think you have to realize that what you're looking at, the actual setup for the treatment, let's say for this line, the clin check, I think the thing that people have to differentiate is the fact that this, what you see on the clin check is not actually where the teeth are going to end up. What you'll see is the tray. That's for the trays. Tray one to 30, tray number two, three, four, and that's how the tray changes to apply a force to the teeth to get that desired tooth movement. Now, in terms of deep bites, the things that we have to deal with to like on a very simple basis, the curve of speed is the, is the big one. That's the coverage that runs from the posterior teeth up to the incisors. Generally in the UK, patients tend to be very class two-ish. There is that lack of interincisal contact. As a result, you get a super eruption of the lower incisors in canines. And as a result, you get this curve where the molars and premolars are sort of lower down and things move up anteriorly, resulting in a deep bite. So the first thing we need to do is solve or correct that curve of speed. So that's the first one. The second factor we look at is the curve of Wilson. So this is the curve, the transversal curve that runs on the cusp of the molars and premolars in the lower jaw up to the premolars and molars on the other side. And it basically indicates that the posterior teeth, lower jaw, if you look at them transversely, they're sort of tipped in like this usually, 
We like to upright and we like to flatten out that curve of Wilson. We then have to look at the inclination of the incisors. Like, you know, David said, if you're intruding incisors, there's a difference between absolute intrusion where you're intruding the tooth down like this along this long axis versus if you're proclining. If I'm proclining my incisors forward, by proclining them forward, I get relative intrusion, which helps towards a bite, deep bite correction. So we're looking at cover speed, cover Wilson, the incisor inclination, we then look at how we can support the movements that we're doing. For example, anterior bite ramps. Anterior bite ramps helps us intrude the lower incisors in order to level the cover speed. It also allows us to get some posterior extrusion. It takes away that intrusive effect of the tray. So we're looking at various factors together that helps us with the deep bite correction, as opposed to just let's overcorrect the, for example, the open bite, the deep bite, yes overcorrect but there are factors that you look at that lead so, so just talk about uh, everything is, is brilliant but just talk about overcorrection so some people are new to aligners right and uh, they might be new to clean checks like even even i had a colleague uh, last week uh, damon rampton who who messaged me on instagram he he had a tough case and then he spoke to the invisalign case cafe on the phone whatever the, the, the guy who the guys who help you and he's relatively new in the aligner world and he was shocked because the, and to you guys, this is like, well, this is obvious, right? But but to a young practitioner starting aligners, okay, they still believe, and that's just like I did, that what you see in the clinch check, what you see is what you get. Whereas you put it beautifully that, no, that's not the, the movement, that's the tray. And if you think of it as this is a tray, and it's like a, a represent, representation of the forces that are going to exactly. happen, uh, it, which is the best explanation I've heard. And if you've got anything else about better, be happy to hear it. But a lot of our colleagues still need to remember that just because you see it in a clinch check, doesn't mean it's going to happen. Uh, so that's really, really important to emphasize. But for those who are, who are starting out really beginners, what is overcorrection? How does that look on a, on, on a clean check? And why is it important? Yeah, I can take it. So yeah, Jazz, I think that's a very good point where you said, you know, it's we call it, it's a force system. It's not a true representation of where the teeth are going to be at the end. So, and you know, when we first start out exactly the same as, you know, everyone else, you, you take it for, you know, it's gospel, whatever you see on the clean check, you think you can't change it. That's exactly what AI or technology says. That's the best way to get from A to Z. And I think as soon as you realize that's actually probably the worst possible way to get to A to Z, then you start, you know, you, you need to be the pilot. You can't have a technician telling you what the best way is. You always, of course, you know, they do a great job. They give you a good baseline, but that baseline needs to be improved quite a lot if you want predictable results. And I think overcorrection, it, it, again, it comes down to understanding that what, what you see on the clean check, it's not what's going to happen in real life. So certain things, for example, from our point of view, we don't overcorrect everything. So we're very confident in the way we, the way we move the teeth. Again, you can change attachments on the clean checks. You can change their thickness, their shape, the orientation, which way they're beveled. You can change, you know, when you do your IPR, you can change how much IPR you do. So everything should be adjustable and you should be looking at these things. Uh, I know it sounds stressful, but, you know, one of the things we talk about on our course is, you know, protocols to say, you know, these are the steps you can follow to make it more easy to follow. But from our side, the things we overcorrect, we never overcorrect like rotations because we feel confident in the way we can move the teeth. And by that, I mean the staging. The staging is the sequence of the movements. That makes a huge difference. Probably the most important factor in Invisalign planning is your staging and round tripping, which we can discuss a little bit about. But yeah, we don't overcorrect rotations. The things we do overcorrect are expansion and vertical changes. So overbite correction and how much we expand because it's exactly the same thing we do with fixed braces. I don't know if you have any experience with fixed braces, Jazz. Have you ever? I, I do. So if you expand an upper arch with fixed braces, you know you bend the wire out. It's a lot wider than it looks. And then you slot it in and you want the wire to ideally, you know, expand for you a little bit. You know, you're not going to get all of that. You might get like 20% of it. Now you have to think about aligners is exactly the same. I don't see why we should do it differently with fixed braces than compared to aligners. Aligners are probably the same strength compared to like a 1925 hat, for example. So if we overcorrect with fixed braces, we should definitely overcorrect with aligners. And that's especially with expansion and especially with the vertical correction as well. If you're finishing your clinch checks with a perfect overbite, I can guarantee it's going to look very imperfect in, in real life. So yes, we do overcorrect. Obviously that depends. So just to, just to make it really uh, tangible. So uh, overcorrection yeah. is basically uh, an example is a deep bite patient. And if you overcorrect them, you're going to, on the clinch check, they'll finish with an AOB. Well, it depends, depends on the case. And these are the things you need to understand. Not every deep bite case is the same. So if you have a, for example, you have a deep bite case, 
where it's very crowded, the incisors are retroclined, then that's a lot easier. Why? It comes back to what Ramtin was saying about the, the relative extrusion and intrusion. When you procline teeth, they, they almost fall over, right? They lean forwards. So it looks like you get some, some intrusion, but it's a relative intrusion. So that's your best friend mm-hmm. when it comes to deep bite case. If you see crowding, retrocline incisors, amazing. Just by aligning the teeth and proclining the teeth, obviously in the correct way, then you can, you can see the deep bite will open up really well. So in those cases, yes, you still need to overcorrect. So for example, if it's like crowding and you've got like a comprehensive package, we tend to finish it kind of edge to edge. But if you've got a case where, for example, you have spacing, spacing is your worst, is like the worst enemy with a deep bite case because it's the opposite. If you close spaces, the teeth retrocline and you get relative extrusion. And when you get relative extrusion, you're going to deepen the bite. So then you have to overcorrect more because you're working against yourself. So yes, you can still fix it and we do it all the time, but you have to make sure you control how much you open the bite in the front basically and overcorrect a bit more. Hey guys, it's just Jazz interfering here with an important message. Remember how we're raising money for Nafisa. Nafisa has SMA type 1 and we are so close to getting genetic therapy for her. Remember, she's a daughter of Sakina who's a dentist just like you. She's one of the Patricerati and her daughter needs our help. So far they've raised and also a little bit of our help, $778,000, which is amazing. But we need about $1.8 million to get this very expensive genetic therapy for Nafisa before she turns age too. Now, the latest update is that if they can reach a million, the company has agreed to start her genetic therapy and they can pay the rest in installments. So we're actually really close to getting Nafisa the care that she needs so we can keep her alive and well. There's a video I recorded all about this on my Instagram page at Protrusive Dental. And if you'd like to support Nafisa, head over to protrusive.co.uk forward slash Nafisa. That's N-A-F-I-S-A. Thanks so much and back to the main episode. I can just add something to that, to that concept. So Exactly what Damon says. We have to be careful with the overcorrection too. We can't overcorrect in a general's ma- generalized manner for everyone. It has to be depending on what other factors are there. But again, it comes down to the fact that we know that there are inherent issues with the line. It's similar to what fixed braces are. Like, like Damon said, you know, fixed braces have this degree. And as you all know, for doing fixed braces, there's a slop inside the bracket. There's play where the wire doesn't quite fully fit the, the bracket which means that some of those forces are lost in translation. With the liners, you can imagine, Jazz, they're super flexible. You can take a tray and you can sort of bend it like this, uh, super flexible, so you have more play, you have more flexibility, you have more force losses. So that's the discrepancy. That overcorrection comes from just overcoming those weaknesses within the plastic where the forces are lost and to try to make up for that. So that you can go away from those studies where you know, excellent studies, the studies that shows that there's a, I don't know, 30% predictability in, in, in incisor intrusion, there's a 50% predictability of canine intrusion, you need to compensate for that and add in the overcorrection to overcome those shortcomings. Just because we haven't covered it, you explained it for those who are well versed in Mizline, which most of the people listening, they, yeah, they'll get that straight away. But for those who's really beginning, an overcorrection is, you know, if the if the tooth needs one millimeter intrusion, you might put in two millimeter intrusion. You're you're doing it too much, basically. Just a, a primitive there. Now, on a seventy five percent deep bite case, that example that we made up, basically, would you ever need to use things like TADS? You know, how often do you guys use TADS to assist you with a deep bite correction? And just more primitive than that, what are TADS? TADS are temporary anchorage devices. They're small mini screws, different diameters, different lengths. You know, the common one that we use is about seven, eight millimeters long, like a mini implant, basically. We place it into the bone for various reasons. And the theory is that by having the screw in the bone, it gives you absolute anchorage. It gives you something to push against or pull against that doesn't move at all. So in a case where you want, for example, to carry out a movement that has, you know, side effects in terms of its movement, or it can cause a worsening we're trying to do, by adding the TADS in, you can take away the reciprocal action of a force. You solely can, for example, putting two low TADS in the lower jaw, you can intrude the incisors without any side effects, and you have 100% anchorage in pulling these down predictably. Okay, so there's just an adjunct to fix or align the therapy or fix braces just to give us a bit more support when needed. To answer your question in terms of why we use them or when we use them, in terms of deep bite, we don't use them a lot, to be completely honest. Uh, we, we usually use tabs for open bites when needed for posterior intrusion. 
we use it sometimes when someone have an, has an increase in size of display in the upper jaw to chew the front teeth up to reduce the gummy smile. And we use it very rarely for deep bites as well. So generally with a deep bite, we tend to put them between the lower lateral incisor and canine, buccally on either side. And the patient then puts the tray in, we'll put a couple of buttons on the inside of the lower canine and maybe the lower lateral incisor. And we'll have an elastic that runs from the screw buccally across the tray if we need to, to buttons uh, lingually. And that will just give us some absolute intrusion, some proclination too, but generally intrusion to solve a deep bite. The times we tend to use it, do you remember I said that to correct the curve of speed, where the molars and premolars are lower down, the incisors are higher up. Sometimes when we correct this, we need, for example, if I'm intruding incisors, I need a lot of support from the posterior teeth. I need anchorage from the molars to give me the sort of, if, I'm, if you imagine, the strength needed to push those lower incisors down. So we tend to, for example, put an attachment on the lower sixes. By having an attachment on the lower six, the tree really locks in. It doesn't lift off. It stays locked in, which gives anchorage needed for the incisors to intrude. If I, for example, don't have those lower molars, let's say I have missing teeth in the lower jaw, posteriorly, I only have the incisors, I'm not going to be able to intrude those incisors if I don't have the anchorage in the posterior teeth. So in cases like that, I might consider putting tabs in instead to compensate the fact, for the fact that I don't have my full mechanics available that I would have available otherwise. Other reasons I would place it again, like I mentioned, if someone has a very deep bite, I don't just want to intrude the lower incisors, but actually partial reason is the over teeth, the upper teeth are over extruded. I want to intrude upper incisors. Often TADS is a lot more of a predictable way to do that. Well, one of the other, so it's good to know that you don't use it so often, but it's, it's, it's there as an option. So you explain that really well in terms of why you might do it. And there's a great description of going from the buckle to the lingual with the two elastics. That's a nice visual that people can imagine. Now, another technique that you mentioned already in the podcast is uh, bite ramps, which I think is very important for correcting deep bites of the liners. Can you explain what bite ramps are? You kind of touched on it. Just explain what they are and where in the protocol, because now we're going to get more into protocols, do you use it? Like, is it from a line of one, have bite ramps all the way through and then even have them in the retainers in the future? Or is it at a certain stage? Can you talk more about what they are and, and how they are used in your protocols? Yeah, so bite ramps, I think that they're crucial in deep bite correction, but it's crucial to use it in the right way. Often I see them used incorrectly and, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a second, but it comes back to the same principle in that inherently aligners want to make the bite deeper because you have this, you normally only occlude in the back it creates an intrusive force to the molars. The molars obviously bite later and you get this anterior and upwards rotation of the mandible. So it deepens the bite just by wearing the trays. So what you're trying to do with anterior bite ramps is twofold. One is you're trying to transmit the force. So you're not biting in the back as much, but you're biting in the front. And then it's the same as like Dahl principle. Imagine you, you know, you have a Dahl appliance, you get intrusion of the upper and lower incisors. And at the same time, you get disclusion of the molars and then they want to obviously uh, erupt until they contact again. Exactly the same as what we do with fixed braces. Sometimes we put these two blobs of composite lingually on the central incisors, come back three, four months later and the you know, posterior teeth are now occluding. Um, and then you remove the bite ramp and you've established a new, basically a new overbite. So we're trying to take the force from the back to the front, but also we're trying to in increase the intrusive force of the incisors in the front. We're trying to... Again, we know they're weak, the aligners, in intruding the incisors. So we're trying to see how can we make it more predictable. So we're increasing the force in the front. So it helps to intrude the incisors a lot easier. Now, bite ramps, you have to be careful where you use them. I think sometimes people use them like, first of all, you should, if, if you want to fix the deep bite, you should be using a canine to canine. So either both the canines, either both the laterals or both the centrals. There's no need to use them, for example, like two to two or three to three. The reason I say that, and the reason that sometimes people use them incorrectly is whenever you use a bite ramp and the way a bite ramp looks on the aligner, it's like a little extension of the plastic, but the plastic is not filled. So that bit of the plastic is not in contact with the tooth. And with aligners, the most important thing is plastic cover. The more plastic cover you have in contact with the tooth, the more 360 control you have. So if you start sacrificing your plastic cover, then you have to make sure it's for a good cause. So let's say, for example, and Invisalign will do this, unfortunately, sometimes. Let's say there's like a, a deep bite, but also a big overjet. If you hit the right threshold, Invisalign will just put on bite ramps for you. 
but then you look at the bite and there's no antagonist contact. The only way a bite round will work if there's antagonist contact. So the first thing you have to check is, is there antagonist contact? Otherwise they're completely useless. And if anything, they're working against what you're trying to do. And then as I said, you don't need to put them in all the teeth. So you put them, for example, on just the laterals or just the centrals or just the canines. A lot of the time we end up putting them on the canines and that's because if, if the tooth needs a big movement, like a big rotation or like a big extrusion or like a torque issue, then we prioritize plastic cover over the need for a bite ramp. I can fix the deep bite in other ways. So because of that, and normally the laterals are always twisted, right? The centrals have like a torque issue in these cases. So in a lot of those cases, we put them on the canines and then we look at the simulation. We see, okay, how, how long are they in contact? Maybe after 20 weeks, I'll tell Invisalign after 20 weeks, remove the bite ramps because then I can see, you know what? The overjet or like a class two div two case, the overjet might increase and suddenly they're not in contact. So you have to really dissect the clinch and see every little bit. Is it useful or is it working against me? Now we're using less tads with deep bites because we're kind of pushing the boundary of what we can do. We're kind of moving towards, we've experimented last year and it works really well. We're trying to increase the force in the front. So this is not for everyone, by the way. Uh, I would not go straight into this, but we started experimenting with actually filling the bite ramps. So you've got physical bite ramps in the back. You have to do that with patients that are very cooperative, that are going to be okay with having, you know, a very strange bite for a good few weeks. I normally do it for about three months. And younger patients, ideally, all the patients will really struggle. So, so this is this is the the bite ramp, like using it, like so actually filling it in the aligner, or or filling it yes. as an attachment on the teeth. No, so, so yeah, you're filling it on the tooth. So imagine you you have your your attachment templates. You actually fill the lingual side of it as well, and then uh, when you take off the tray, it's still stuck on the teeth. So exact, exactly, so when the same they eat, when they're eating and stuff, basically, you're still getting the benefit. Basically, that that's the idea, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm. but the, these cases, Jazzy, again, you have to be careful because it's it's very tricky for the patient, trickier than fixed braces, I find. Mm. Um, so you have to have that mm. conversation with them. And I only really reserve that for cases where they might need TADs. So I say, look, either we go down the TAD route or we can go down this route. I really only use the cases where it's like there's no crowding. The teeth are already slightly inclined you know, forwards. So I don't have that luxury of the relative intrusion. Then you need almost like, a, a level of absolute intrusion. They work a treat, mm -hmm. but you have to be careful. You have to make sure you've got balanced contacts. There's a lot of things to take into account, but this is more towards like the advanced level. There's probably... I, I think I think the protrusionality listening today, a lot of these are very restorative minded and very well-versed in dull. And actually they're, they're thinking, yeah, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. And it does. And certainly yeah. you've blown my mind. I mean, I, I'm, I'm guilty of uh, treating a deep bite case or having a deep bite element and be like, yeah, bite ramps, go for it. I didn't even think about the fact that it wasn't covering the, the tooth. And so that's opened my mind. So I, uh, that, that's great. I love that. I'm sure there's others who, who feel the same. So guys, I'm, I'm loving this already. So I want to discuss now about the actual, the meaty, the juicy parts, which everyone's been waiting for, right? It's actually your, your secret sauce, yeah? Your aligner protocols. The top one you get all the time, like, hey, uh, DMing you like, hey, what's the best attachment for X movement? What's the best attachment for that movement? I, I, I bet you guys are sick of that question, right? So, so, so spill all basically. I know every case is unique, but uh, what would you say to someone who says, what is the best attachment? And also, what are generally the treatment protocols? And I think you mentioned also about round tripping and what that means as well i'm sure you'll get into that uh, in terms of how you explain it yeah Jack, so the protocols uh, is important we have our own um, we're calling the cat protocols the complete aligner program protocols it's just something that works really well for us we're not saying this is the absolute right way to do it it just works very particularly for us you know it's based on like ten thousand plus cases so we trial and tested over the years and we've come up with something that works you know extremely effectively and predictably and it's just understanding if you understand what causes the deep bite like rampton said you've got accentuated curve of speed you're trying to level that curve of speed so we break it into movement mechanics and reaction mechanics. So movement mechanics is basically the movements you have to do on the clin check to make it look the way you want. And reaction mechanics are controlling some of the reactionary forces as a result of that. So essentially what you want to do, you want to intrude the three to three and you want to extrude posteriorly to that. And that works great. It's action reaction. So as one side goes down, one side goes up. And what we normally do is we, we find like a premolar that's like our reference point, the one that's kind of the highest. And then we just align, we just extrude the other uh, posterior teeth to the same level. So we're trying to get away from that curve and we want to try and flatten it in the back. So that's kind of our step one and step two. Uh, find the reference premolar, extrude the other teeth so they're on the same level. And then you want to intrude. Initially, we intrude the three to three by, you know, millimeter to two, depending on the case. 
then we deselect the canines and we select your lateral incis the incisor to incisor and we intrude those a little bit further again by about a millimeter or two, depending on the case. The reason for that is, you know, canines are a little bit more predictable in how much we get with the intrusion that we ask for. So we don't need to overcorrect as much, whereas incisors are, are much weaker. So the step one is just, that's the movement mechanics. We're trying to create like a fixed braces, a sweep effect. We're not trying to go for flat cover speed. We're trying to go the opposite. Then once you've decided which way, you know, how to set up those teeth, then you have to decide how to allow those movements to happen. So that's the anchorage bit. That's the attachments part of it. And attachments are absolutely crucial in deep bite cases. You need attachments in the back, like Rampton said, you know, as you intrude the front, like a seesaw, the back wants to come up, which is good because you want the posterior teeth to extrude, but that won't happen if the plastic is lifting off the back. So you need an attachment in the back, normally one on the molar, one on the premolar, the right type of attachment as well to lock it in and to help this extrusion take place. Because as soon as the plastic is allowed to play, you're losing so much force, not just in the back, but also in the front as well. So you really lock in the plastic in the back and then you allow for that intrusion to happen a lot more accurately. You also need some attachments in the front, normally on the canines and maybe one each on the incisors. And that's for the canines, it's for anchorage again, to help intrude the incisors. Because if you remember, they need to intrude a bit more than the canines. And then the incisors, we normally put a couple of attachments on there, not for anchorage, but to, to stiffen the plastic. The more attachments you have, the less play, the less bouncing you have of the, of the tray. So that's just to really stiffen the plastic and almost making the tray like a thicker wire so you can exert more of your force. And then you check your overcorrection, make sure you know, is it edge to edge? Do you want to open more if it's like a spacing case? So that's a very quick summary. Obviously our deep by lecture is, is like an hour and a half in reality, but that's a very quick mm -hmm. summary of what you should be looking at when you're planning your deep by cases. And then you look mm -hmm. at your accessories, like making sure there's at the end of your occlusion, it should look heavy in the back and obviously open in the front or no contact in the front. You need to check where your anterior bite ramps are. If there's any heavy rotations, like I said, you want to put them on the canines. If the canines need big movements, then you just leave them off completely, for example. And then when it gets more advanced, like an extreme deep bite, that's when you start looking at, you know, filling bite ramps and things like this. I hope that gives you a very quick overview. Yeah, no, it, it certainly protocols. does. Um, just because just you mentioned about round tripping and for the younger colleagues, uh, it's something yeah. I'm very familiar with. But uh, how would you describe what round tripping is and, and, and how might you notice it and what relevance does it have specifically to, to deep bites, if at all? So, I mean, the, the thing with round tripping is that I think we, we've gone a little bit away from it here in the UK. For some reason, everyone seems to think that round tripping is something that should be avoided at all costs. Whereas, you what, know, what is round tripping? Yeah, okay. So round tripping is basically the tipping out of teeth, the buckle tipping out of teeth to create space, medial and distal to the teeth to eliminate collisions, basically. And then once you have that space and there are no collisions, you then retract back everything into alignment. So what you do is instead of going from like A to B, you go like A to C, and then you bring it back to B because you're trying to do with collisions, so you, without collisions. You're trying to, instead of just aligning teeth, for example, you tip them out first so there's no collision between those teeth. And then once there's no collisions, you then retract them back into alignment. It's what we do with fixed braces. When you put up, when you have fixed brackets on the teeth, you put a wire in. You don't just magically align the teeth. The wire wants to go back to its original position, as you know, as it goes towards its original position, we often round trip. Now, we can control the amount of round tripping we do. We want to reduce it sometimes, in which case, for example, with fixed braces, you might take out the lower premolars. You don't bond the lower two to two. You, you retract the canines first. So you have space around the laterals. Then you bond or engage the laterals and incisors. It's the same with aligners. You're basically ensuring that the alignment happens without collisions. Now, very important because if you're treating a deep bite case, the alignment that you create is what helps you as you procline to create space and get them into alignment. That proclination is giving you that relative intrusion to help you in the deep bite correction. So in order to be able to solve a deep bite, you need to accurately and predictably solve crowding. And that crowding has to be solved using round tripping. If anyone tells you don't round trip with aligners, it's not orthodontics. It doesn't, it doesn't work predictably. I, I agree. I mean, when I was a uh, junior uh, years of learning aligners and stuff uh, and orthodontics in general, uh, I, I had that sort of belief in me that was passed on to me that don't round trip. Like it's, it's really bad for uh, gingival reasons and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you don't want to see that on the, on the clinic check that happens and do lots of heavy IPR, do it early, do lots of stripping. Uh, so you, you avoid that round tripping. But then when I did a few cases of uh, fixed uh, appliances and I realized, oh, actually, yeah, this 
This is how fixed appliances works, right? And so why are we so, so afraid of it? Yes, there might be some times that you might want to slow down or just be careful and sequence things, right? Uh, which you guys are masters of. But uh, yeah, it's a good lesson there for GDP. Don't be so afraid as it's made out to be. It's not as bad of a thing. Uh, and so uh, saying that, as you guys know, I've got to pick up my kid, but I'd love to promote and talk about your course. People are raving about it on, on Facebook from what I've seen, talking about uh, the, the definitive course to learn aligner mechanics, the best attachment, the best protocols. So uh, tell us about your course. Uh, you know, where does it run? How often you hold it? Yeah, the, the complete aligner program is kind of our pride and joy. I think we found there was there was a need for further education with aligners. I think people go on this certification course and then the Invisalign is like, good luck, do orthodontics. And, you know, it takes three years for us full time to fully understand orthodontics. So that's one side of it. And then the other side is you, you don't actually understand the mechanics of it. So what we've tried to do is get people away from the issues that we had, the journey we had to get through, you know, go through all the rubbish, all the shit to be able to get to where we are now. So we've made it very, very simple. I love getting spoon fed. I don't like fluff talk. I want direct step-by-step -step understanding of this is exactly how to get from A to Z. A lot of time you go on a course and it all makes sense during the day and then you leave and you're like, yeah, it was amazing, but I have no idea what to do now. So we want to move away from that. So we give these set protocols and it's all in this big handbook to take away of not just clinic, not just like theoretical clin check. You know, yes, we go through every malocclusion. We give them set protocols for deep bites, open bites, attachments, when to use what attachment. But we also discuss things like how to fit your Invisalign tray, how to streamline that journey, what tools you can use to increase the efficiency for that. We talk about IPR in detail because I feel IPR is under talked about, you know, such an important part. We talk about how to do it. We show videos of, you know, exactly how we do it, how to stage it. People don't understand you can do IPR at a later date com compared to what Invisalign tells you. So it's all about doing things at the right time. Uh, we take away some of the stress that people have about aligners and IPR to make it very simple because it doesn't need to be complicated. Orthodontics is very simple but you need the tools to get there. So yeah, intense two days. If everyone really wants to kind of push their aligner to the next level or next levels even, I think it's a no-brainer if you want to learn more about that. And who is your ideal delegate in the sense that do you want someone who's like, literally just done like the certification and they've not done a single case or do you like it if they've done like maybe five ten cases who's the ideal candidate to learn from your course i'm saying we can i think the thing with the jazz is that it's the, the, the all the protocols that we give are based on orthodontic principles that's what it is it's not like some sort of shortcut it's just us taking someone's understanding and telling them this is what you need to focus on it really is good for anyone starter to advanced users and I think something we're introducing very soon is like an introduction part as well, which will cover all the basics, basic aspects of it as well. It's going to be like an online thing that people do before the two-day course as part of the course. So I honestly think that it's it's beneficial for everyone that wants to do a lot of cases and wants to take one more cases. And, you know, we are doing, we're doing a couple, couple every year in London, couple of courses every year in London. And we're also doing our first course in Los Angeles next year as well in, in May. So exciting no times ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be cool. Um, How do I book that one? <laughs> yeah, you're in, man. You're in. Anytime you want, Jazz. Yeah, LA's the one, though. LA's the one. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're doing it there. Just amazing. Fun. Well done, guys. I'm very, yeah, thank you very so Very proud, man. Well done. That's, that's amazing. Uh, well, I, I encourage everyone. I'm putting the show notes. So just check out your cases. Like They speak for themselves. Uh, your amazing Instagram page. I was checking out your stories the other day. And I think you were talking about deep bites on that, on that story, actually. So if you want to see the, the proof, then, then have a look at your protocols uh, online. I'll put the website in the show notes, but uh, you can just share the website so people can log in and, and learn about how to upgrade their aligner knowledge. The website is uh, www.aligners.co.uk, but without the G. Don't ask why. It's the only website we could find uh, <laughs> that wasn't taken. So it's A L I N E R S. Aligners. Aligners. Aligners exactly. without the G. Perfect. Amazing. Well, Damon Ramton, thanks so much for your, for your time. Uh, and I look forward to, to, to meeting you one day, hopefully in the flesh, hopefully in LA, who knows? Uh, <laughs> but that's very exciting. You know, the American audience will, ha will have something to, to look forward to as well, as well as uh, the Brits. And I think everyone has gained. Uh, for me, it's just like little nuggets here and there. I mean, I've learned a lot from you guys, but that whole little thing about the bite rounds being overused, I'm definitely guilty of that. So I'm going to change that about my protocols uh, right away. Uh, and you covered a lot in terms of overcorrection and the mechanics, the curved spay, everything. So I, yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think everyone's going to love it so please do comment below guys if you if you enjoy this uh, episode today and uh, i'll catch you soon guys thank you so much 
Thank you so much. Thank guys. you, Josh. Really appreciate it. Well, there we have it, guys. Now we can apply a few extra techniques to make sure we get more predictable deep bite correction. If you know any other orthodontic or aligner topics that you'd like me to cover, please let me know. Comment below. And if you've made it this far, at least we deserve a like if you're watching this, if you're listening. Again, I really appreciate you listening all the way to the end. And you deserve some CPD. You deserve a certificate to prove that you've learned something. And you can get that on protrusive.app website. Answer a few questions. You get your certificate emailed to you by Marie. And speaking of, I want to thank my team as always nowadays, Erica Alan Benitez, who is my producer, Priscilla Jane Facun, who produced the premium notes for this, and Marie Benitez, who will sort you you out with CPD. Thanks again for Tristarati and I'll see you same time, same place next week.